Assalamu alaikum students. So today we start a uh, rather tricky topic of cardiac output. And uh, during the course of these lectures, uh, I will be explaining what I mean by the word tricky. Uh, it's, uh, it brings together these two highly complex uh, uh, components of the CVS, i.e. the heart and the circulation. Uh, so, uh, let me just first explore what would we be doing in this three lecture series, which is uh, out of which these two lectures, the first two are very linked. Okay, so this will happen on Monday and this should be uh, discussed on uh, Tuesday. Uh, but please remember that these two uh, are linked. Uh, this forms the basis of this lecture basically so <clears throat> you can't uh, it's 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 uh, highly advisable to go in sequence uh, so you 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 should first uh, listen to this view this uh, uh, read up on it understand it discuss it with a colleague uh, and then we move on to uh, the the second lecture uh, I, I i envisage that you may be uh, may, you may feel like discussing this or uh, 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 learning about this throughout the week, this coming week, uh, because uh, there are things which are overlapping uh, and you will need to zoom in and zoom out uh, of this discussion. So at one time you'll find yourself uh, concentrating on one aspect of the heart or circulation and on, on the other hand, you will be required to look at it from a bird's eye view. Uh, so a lot of going in and out uh, re uh, is required in these lectures and hence the sequence needs to be observed. Uh, another point um, uh, to, to, to have, a, have an understanding of what's gonna happen over the, uh, uh, the span of especially these two lectures is that this lecture basically is, you can say this is a basic sort of lecture. <clears throat> it lays down the simple principle, uh, uh, treats the heart and circulation uh, sort of separately, uh, 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 describes what the heart does in cardiac output, uh, discusses what circulation contributes towards cardiac output. Uh, so it really gives you a, I would say a fragmented picture of the cardiovascular system as far as cardiac output is concerned. It's lecture two where everything comes together. Okay, so the bit about heart that you will learn and understand and discuss and the same, uh, uh, same understanding of circulation that you have uh, accumulated by, by uh, discussing this particular lecture will come together as one system in this lecture. Okay, this is basically where it, it the whole thing comes together. You actually will hopefully appreciate that cardiovascular system indeed is one monolith. It's, it's one unit indeed where what the heart does has a consequence on circulation and what the circulation does has a consequence on heart. So who does what and who does how much is will be discussed quantitatively speaking and yes, graphs are involved in lecture two, okay? Right, and lecture three then we will be discussing measurement of cardiac output, which after these two lectures, I, I'm pretty sure you, it will be a piece of okay cake for you. And uh, we'll finish it off this particular topic by discussing what cardiac work is. So whatever card, heart, the heart does, uh, it is defined uh, in terms of work and uh, also oxygen require, requirement by the cardiac muscle uh, as a function of the work. It's a pretty interesting discussion. Uh, and it links to uh, uh, the clinical side of things very nicely. So this is the topic plan as far as cardiac output is concerned. Remember that cardiac output is one of those uh, key discussions of this whole um, unit, the cardiovascular unit. It's the prized topic. Uh, if, you, if you have a good understanding of the heart uh, and a good understanding of circulation, uh, you will appreciate that how these two come together to form this uh, 
this this very fluent uh, interdependent uh, organs if i may say heart being one and the circulation if i may say that it's an organ so these two organs they come in they come together in sync and how they play it out it's it's literally a sim not literally but metaphorically speaking it's a, it's a symphony uh, so let's let's start playing right so today's lecture basically is a, is is uh, uh, in terms of slides there are just three slides uh, uh, not including this one this just gives you the learning objectives uh, it has uh, we will define cardiac output uh, we'll look at its values and then the mainstay the main focus of this discussion today is the factors affecting it or regulating it what is cardiac output quote unquote made of okay what are the actors what are the the movers and shakers of cardiac output okay this we'll do today in detail uh, however it's just three slides don't get too, too too ahead of yourself don't get too excited that's a short lecture or whatever i don't know how much time it will take uh, i don't know i i record these lectures live uh, so number of slides can be off throwing uh, you need to really give it a good chin wag uh, because uh, when, when we we look at this particular topic it's it's chunky it's uh, there's a lot of things packed into one one slide okay so what is cardiac output cardiac output basically is the quantity of blood pumped by each ventricle per unit time which is conventionally per per minute okay so uh, in 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 males it's around 5.6 you you can remember 5 liters per minute generally speaking but if you uh, if you want to be specific this is the value in males and 4.9 per liters per minute in females on an average this does vary in the normal uh, um, uh, range it, there is a variance uh, so that's that a common mistake of students a very very silly mistake of students uh, that they make when they are asked to define cardiac output is they mention the silliest of definitions by saying quantity of blood pumped by the left ventricle into the aorta okay now if you understand if you have the basic knowledge about the cardiovascular system as being one you should have the sense to understand that the left side of the heart the blood that is coming in the left side of the heart is actually coming from the right side of the heart okay so if the right side of the heart does not push 5 liters in a minute where will you get the 5 liters uh, per minute from the left heart right because they are in series okay uh, so basically both ventricles uh, per unit time pump the same amount of blood because it's just one series it's one common thing <clears throat> something that is missed uh, in a in a in a viva and you just uh, cram the, these definitions from one book or the other and hence uh, the examiner has a has a heyday with you guys so it's each ventricle all right um, however there are situations where both of the cardiac outputs right and left may vary so some pathology in the left ventricle so for example an mi okay myocardial infarction in the left side of the heart in the left ventricle specifically may cause it to decrease its contractile uh, performance and hence it it won't, it, it does is it, it doesn't uh, 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 its uh, output is not enough in this particular scenario so blood starts to accumulate where in the lungs because left ventricle is not quote unquote clearing the blood from the lung and pushing it into the aorta in this case the right side of the heart will do its job so that's cardiac output ie the blood pumped by the right ventricle per minute or whatever unit of time you're taking usually it's per minute will be will be normal in this situation because right heart is fine it's the left heart that is the problem now you can understand that the right heart is pumping normal blood into the lungs while the left heart is not clearing it out because it's weak okay so where will the blood starts to accumulate in the lungs you will have pulmonary conge congestion and this is a serious issue okay uh, so in this case cardiac output will differ what about in a, let's take another scenario if the right ventricle uh, develops an issue which interferes with this contraction and left ventricle is uh, fine then you will have pooling of blood in the periphery 
i.e. in the veins and in the tissues because the right side is not clearing blood it the blood is coming via venous return into it but it's not contracting properly so there will be congestion on the in the circulation side where right uh, uh, right ventricle is supposed to clear the blood from circulation and pump it into the lungs okay so again congestion is the word is the key word so basically this leads to congestive cardiac failure these scenarios where an anomaly or a disease occurred inside a ventricle which caused its contractility to decrease and pooling of blood started to happen behind it for, for left ventricle behind means in the lungs and for right ventricle behind means in the tissue in the peripheral tissues this caused a congestive picture we call it congest and, and if, if this is not relieved the patient uh, goes into congestive cardiac failure the heart fails to do its job leading to congestion congestive cardiac failure ccf so this is a definition and some 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 clinical stuff to think about uh, cardiac index is uh, is a very useful um, uh, a use, a useful concept uh, a useful statistic in the sense that it basically divides the cardiac output according to the surface area of the person okay so in in, a, in an average person uh, the range is 2.6 to 4.2 liters per minute per meter square average being 3.2 okay so this is an interesting thing the maximum value is at age 10 around age 10 and then it starts to decrease okay so at, at age 10 you have cardiac output uh, surface area ratio maximum uh, heart is new body is small so the ratio is beautiful it's uh, it's uh, it's very, very mathematically sound. But as the size increases, obviously the, uh, the, the heart uh, uh, will, will have to increase its performance, uh, then gradually decreases during adolescence and adulthood. And when you hit old age, it, it, it dips down further. Uh, this is an important stat as well. If the cardiac index falls below 1.8, the person is labeled as having cardiogenic shock. Um, uh, you will be uh, yes in the at the end of this uh, this whole uh, circulation we'll be discussing what shock is shock is an inadequacy of circulation to maintain blood flow to the tissues and if it's cardio if there are many many types uh, if it's uh, the type is cardiogenic it means that the heart is the is the culprit uh, in failing the circulation uh, of its obligations to uh, fulfill blood flows to various organs and hence in this case cardiac index will fall way below the normal 3.2 and and below 1.8 is uh, is a big problem but this is cardiac output okay right so now uh, do you remember this diagram basically at the at the start of these lectures uh, i will be uh, uh, sharing the the link of, of those lectures here you, you should uh, see it uh, popping up any minute, any second, or it already must have, because I can't time it at the moment. I'll be doing it when I upload these lectures. So you, if you, if you have no clue about what is what these things mean, basically means that you haven't uh, heard those lectures. Please do. You can pause this and uh, first play those lectures where I basically describe what this setup means. So I'm not going to repeat all of that. I will just skim through the details. This is a preparation which we, we did. This is a pump and we basically connected it with a low compliance uh, tubing. Uh, and here is a stenosis. It's a, it's a high resistance stenosis that we created. And then it led to a, uh, a larger tube uh, and that tube went back into the pump. Basically, we created the cardiovascular system. A simple cardiovascular system where the pump represented the heart. This uh, low compliance uh, tubing uh, more 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 uh, muscular tubing is is basically the arterial tree uh, the the resistance the high resistance stenosis basically are the arterioles which generate all that peripheral resistance and and the total peripheral resistance tpr is something that you should have a very clear concept now of and then uh, uh, beyond the arterioles we have the capillaries and the capillaries then eventually make the veins okay now this is a very important diagram uh, in the sense that I, I, at in the in the initial lectures i did not go into details of this but 
really you can you can study the entire cardiovascular system uh, minus the quantitative uh, graphical data that we'll be discussing in lecture two uh, with, uh, except that the rest you can pretty much discuss it here now I'll, I'll, I'll try to fill you in on how important this diagram is on a cursory look look at look at how it's arranged i mean obviously it's a simple diagram in the sense that arteries are not just one tube and veins are not just one tube arteries are many and they divide out of uh, the main aorta they branch and then sub branch and etc etc eventually making arterioles and then arterioles make uh, a lot of divisions to make art uh, the capillaries arterial end of the capillaries which then coalesce to the uh, the, the venular uh, side of capillaries which then makes venules and small veins and then big veins and inferior and uh, uh, superior uh, vena cavi which go back into the heart but if you if we just 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 uh, indulge in this uh, diagram for a bit uh, see what's happening what is happening is heart is providing the delta p that i have been talking about throughout those first two three lectures uh, it basically provides it it provides the push uh, for circulation okay uh, but before we do that if you remember i i told you without turning it on without turning the heart on you just fill it up with blood the whole of the system you fill it up with blood right now theoretically speaking the heart is not doing anything it's just silent okay and when you have filled the blood, uh, filled the system with blood uh, to specifically the extent that nothing is dilated by your filling of the blood. So it's not uh, underfilled and not overfilled. It's just enough filled so that the vessels are open, patent, and taut. T A U T taut. Okay. Uh, they are not dilated and they are not constricted. Okay. They're just at their resting diameter. See? Okay. That reading, you, you take a reading of that pressure, whatever that pressure is. That pressure will be referred to as MCFP, mean circulatory filling. Filling. This is the hint. Filling pressure. This is the circulatory filling pressure which is inside the vasculature when the heart is not pumping okay we will we will look at it what is it what is its clinical importance it has huge clinical implications but for the moment just remember what is it and how does it come about it is the pressure value and by the way its uh, value normal value is plus 7 mmhg so plus 7 mmhg is the soft quote unquote soft don't write it softish uh, pressure that the blood is exerting on the vessels when it's not being pushed it's not flowing is it's just sitting in circulation uh, nicely and peacefully so obviously there is a hydrostatic pressure it it has it will exert a hydrostatic pressure because of the the, the uh, effect of gravity it has a weight of course so that by virtue of that weight only that pressure is 7 mmhg you got that i hope you did now you start at you start the heart you literally just turn the key and the heart has start start pumping now you 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 imagine that this is an entire film of blood this is one uh, how do i say this this is i this whole when you fill this entire circulation with blood it's Continuous, isn't it? It's a, yeah, that's the word. It's a continuous column. It's one column. In the middle, you just you just have stuck your pump, the heart. Now, when you turn it on, the heart will push this quote unquote continuous column forwards, won't it? So, the direction of flow is this: the heart will push this column, this continuous column, in this way down the arteries, through the stenosis the arterioles and up the veins okay i want you to imagine that this is one continuous column for 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 the while for 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 the benefit of this uh, uh, diagram okay now when the heart pushes it this column the pressure inside the vessels increase increase above mcfp 
because M MCFP was the pressure at peace, at rest. Now you have something pushing and shoving uh, pressure down its throat. So what will happen is that arteries will come under pressure because you're pushing, pushing the water column on, on them. Okay. The amount is the same, but you're displacing the blood from here and piling it towards the arteries. This is what it does, isn't it? The heart pulls the uh, blood from the, the venous side and pushes it, shoves it into the arterial side. Okay. When it does that, it will naturally, because it has displaced this volume into this, into this segment, what will it do? It will trigger off that wave front that we talked about in probably the third or the fourth chapter when we talk, talked about arterial pulse and how it uh, is generated by the function of the heart. And then it travels down the arterioles and then it withers around the, art, uh, I beg your pardon, it travels down the arteries and then it withers around the arterioles and then dies down in the capillaries, right? That wave front is because the heart displaced some volume from this side to this side so that this gets distended. The pressure, mean circulatory filling pressure now is not operatable in the sense that uh, the pressure will go above seven. And indeed, during systole, it goes above, it goes around 120. And then because it's uh, elastic, uh, these are elastic vessels, then it recoils on top of the, uh, on the blood that is, has been introduced, which has dilated it. When it recoils, it, that value is 80. Uh, and that is how the blood is then propelled forwards. That's the diastolic pressure. So now, I have uh, introduced a, cer a certain dynamic in, your, in, in, in front of you where the heart picked up a volume from uh, uh, the, the, the venous side, pushed it on the arterial side, where everything before this event was at MCFP. Uh, but now that you have a pump that is actively pushing blood into the arterial side, you get the pressure more. So this is what generates blood pressure okay this is a new view for you uh, uh, to look at it okay and while we are at it uh, let's just finish this off this bit off first the blood pressure is basically a, a product of cardiac output and total peripheral resistance and it's 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 beautiful you understand this uh, it obviously will depend on the amount of blood which was displaced from here to here this is cardiac output okay the amount of blood pumped by each ventricle per unit time. Yes. So that is one factor that determines the pressure inside the arteries. And the second is the status of the, of the diameter of the arteries. Okay. So you will be discussing this with your tutorial teachers, uh, how TPR uh, uh, affects cardiac output and so on and so forth. Uh, and in blood pressure, we've already done this under blood pressure definitions and I think it was the third or the fourth chapter that how blood pressure is really the product of cardiac output and TPR. So, so that we've done, but we've sort of done it today in a slightly different way. We've, we've, we've discussed this as a combination of the vasculature and the pump in between. Okay. I hope you understand the slight difference here, the subtlety. Okay. So uh, first, let me just wrap this up. So this we've discussed now cardiac output is basically the stroke volume into heart rate. So we are discussing the profile of the heart. What is cardiac output? Basically, cardiac output is a way to, 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 to express uh, the, the efficiency of heart as a pump, right? Uh, so what, what does a pump do? The pump uh, pumps stuff, okay? So it's the number of piston movements uh, uh, that the, the pump can generate. Uh, the number of times the piston moves against whatever fluid you're using. Okay. Uh, and uh, let, 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 let's just imagine how forceful each movement of the piston is. That's now just apply that to, to heart. So it's the number of times that it would uh, 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 con uh, work, contract heart rate uh, into stroke volume, the, the intensity of each uh, 
contraction uh, what each contraction how much blood can it displace its ability that stroke volume okay uh, so the product of this is basically cardiac output okay amount and rate and then cardiac output goes on to become a key determinant of the pressure inside the arteries along with the total peripheral resistance right uh, mind you uh, i i take that you have uh, discussed uh, uh, and have been taught the concept of afterload and preload uh, when you were discussing and studying heart physiology but oops but let me just uh, uh, recap that for you afterload basically is the is the pressure against which heart has to work okay so it's the pressure uh, in the aorta which the left ventricle sorry about that uh, the left ventricle needs to generate enough pressure so that it overcomes the pressure inside the aorta and open the aortic valve so left ventricle is contracting left uh, aortic valve is closed left ventricle is contracting and contracting and contracting till it generates enough pressure to open this aortic valve inside the aorta i hope you you follow this this is a basic information of the heart uh, uh, and and opening of the aortic valve inside the aorta is only possible if you overcome the pressure inside the aorta okay this pressure which the ventricle has to overcome is called afterload afterload okay right we've done this so we've done this section of the diagram um, and now we are discussing what's happening here so basically if you if you realize what we discussed at the beginning i when i mentioned that the okay so uh, some technical issues happened in the last uh, video it has been interrupted this is simply a continuation of where we left off i was discussing having discussed this part of the, of the diagram i was discussing uh, and rather emphasizing uh, that you should notice what we did uh, when we were introducing what the pump actually does what the pump does is it displaces blood from this part this point uh, which is where the veins have brought back blood to this point where it is which is the start of the arteries so it's basically a displacer of volume one may argue that blood being introduced in this section is at the cost of this section so you are removing blood from the veins the venous side of uh, the circulation and introducing it into the arteries okay so this is how we are now proceeding in this concept this venous return which constitutes uh, the blood that is coming back into the heart is is basically of a very key significance because if you don't return blood via venous return to the heart what what will the heart do the heart needs this venous return to come in regularly and at a constant rate for it to do what it does i.e displace the blood from the way the, this side to the arteries okay now the perceptive among you uh, would be slightly worried in the sense that they would think that okay uh, crucially speaking if you remove this blood and introduce it here you are basically removing volume from this side okay so wouldn't the venous return decrease question mark question mark how is that as a question that is a question and a half isn't it you are removing venous blood from the veins side of the circulation introducing it into the arterial side of circulation shouldn't the venous return then drop this is a question that i would like you to think about throughout this particular lecture and also during the second lecture the tuesday lecture okay um, hopefully you will be able to answer this well and if i forget uh, tomorrow i'll answer it uh, uh, because I, I i wouldn't remember that i put it as a question you'll get lucky but it's a, it's a very it's a nice nugget of a question okay think about it the actually the, the hint actually uh, resides in a statement that i made about the circulation uh, in the beginning anyhow so this venous return is referred to as can be referred to as preload preload okay 
So as opposed to afterload, which is the pressure against which the heart contracts, preload is the stuff, is the blood, or the amount of blood that comes back to the heart, which, which basically the heart needs to deal with, sort out, push forwards, okay? Uh, uh, imagine a, a waiter who has gone to the, who has taken an order and he's gone to the kitchen and now he has your order on his uh, tray, okay? Now he has to come out of the kitchen through the revolving two-way door of the kitchen, you know, that door which uh, uh, goes uh, both ways, it's free, okay? And he has to pass through that and come to your table. So the stuff on the tray is the preload, okay? Afterload is the resistance of that swinging door. Now, if you are a naughty customer, and if you place something against that door, okay, on one side, the waiter will have to push the door, isn't it? To bring the food outside. He'll have to push the door. Uh, so increasing his effort to come out of the kitchen and into the lobby. Okay. So that's the afterload. Okay. So whatever you dish, quote unquote, dish to the heart is the preload, the venous return, preload. And whatever then the heart needs to just uh, convey these contents, this preload into the artery, the pressure against which it has to work is the afterload. Okay, so this is uh, pretty much what we have on this slide. We've discussed, ah, there's one thing, mean circulatory, there are two filling pressures, mean circulatory filling pressure and mean systemic filling pressure. It's very simple. Uh, mean circulatory filling pressure basically means the entire circulation. It includes pulmonary circulation. Mean systemic filling pressure only refers to the systemic circulation. Okay, this is an important point to remember. Okay, now this is that slide. This is that master slide which basically talks about uh, factors affecting or 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 uh, factors regulating uh, cardiac output. We'll go, go nice and slow on this. So he, he, he's mentioned it's actually a very nice diagram, a flowchart. Um, it basically divides cardiac output, the the factors uh, that affect cardiac output or constitute cardiac output into two. One is stroke volume and the other is heart rate, okay? Most of the heart rate stuff and the stroke volume stuff you should have uh, discussed or, or uh, studied under heart physiology when you were discussing cardiac cycle. Uh, in cardiac cycle, right after that, there's a discussion in Guyton uh, uh, where he talks about stroke volume, he defines stroke volume, uh, uh, discusses Frank Starling law and this, that, the other. And then heart rate, right at the end of that chapter, he discusses heart rate, effect of sympathetics and parasympathetics on the heart rate and that, that sort of thing. This is basically that. However, we basically will be discussing it uh, together and uh, I'll be discussing some additional factors right here uh, in a bit, okay? So basically, as I have labeled it here, cardiac factors, this flow chart is cardiac factors. The, the cardiac factors that affect cardiac output. And then as I mentioned, there are circulatory factors that affect cardiac output. And then there are some conceptual overlapping factors which affect cardiac output. So if you get an SEQ, which uh, asks you to, to comment or give a summary or whatever adjective that they use, uh, to describe how cardiac output gets uh, regulated or the factors affecting cardiac output. Basically, these are the three headings that I would like you to use in that, in that discussion. Number one, cardiac factors. Number two, circulatory factors. Number three, coupling factors, okay? We start with cardiac factors. So basically, uh, the main two uh, characters are stroke volume and heart rate. We'll start with stroke volume. Stroke volume, what is stroke volume? Stroke volume is the amount of blood uh, that a ventricle ejects per beat. Remember, this also is one of the common mistakes. Cardiac output is a per time uh, 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 definition or uh, parameter. Parameter. So it's amount of blood pumped by each ventricle per unit of time, right? What is stroke volume? Stroke volume is the amount of blood pumped by each ventricle per beat. When we talk about beat, naturally, 
we are talking about contraction. Beat is contraction. So the its its stroke volume will be determined by how hard it can contract, and hence we will obviously be revising. You will be revising the myocardium and all that sort of thing. Remember, you discussed. We discussed. Uh, you, uh, you studied uh, Frank Starling law. That becomes operational here, and I'll I'll just uh, brush up on your on the Frank Starling law here a bit. So stroke volume is one of the key determinants of cardiac output. In addition to heart rate, so when we discuss stroke volume, it's determined by the force of contraction of the myocardium. Now this force of contraction basically is influenced by two uh, 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 two influencers or two factors. One is and diastolic volume i'll dilate on it in a bit the second is contractility okay so for a, for the moment i would like you to concentrate on these two these two in themselves is a bit of a mini lecture okay it's it's quite thick the information here so once again force of contraction depends on gets influenced from end diastolic volume and contractility what is end diastolic volume edv end diastolic volume is basically the amount of blood that is collected in the ventricle just before it goes into systole. In other way, whatever in during diastole, whatever amount of blood that is accumulated inside a ventricle is its end diastolic volume, i.e., at the end of diastole, whatever volume is collected here. Okay. The perceptive student will immediately link this with preload. This is preload. Uh, how do you get preload to become end diastolic volume? Venous return. So you will find that venous return preload uh, can be used interchangeably. Okay. Venous return is a physical term. Preload is a concept. Okay. And both basically are linked with end diastolic volume because this is what they eventually become. Okay. They become end diastolic volume. Right. And this is where I would like to take your attention to the Starling curve. If you remember, uh, the Starling curve, uh, let me give you a quick, uh, uh, hold on, we go for share screen, right. So basically, if you see, this is the Starling curve, okay? and what is the on the x axis you have stretch on the on the y axis you have force this is the frank starling law what is the frank starling law in layman's term frank starling law is the amount whatever amount of blood within physiological limits of course that ends up in the blood and the in the heart the same is pumped by the by the heart forwards into the arterial side this is what you read how do you translate that into some more intelligible uh, bits of information well, when the, but the blood, the venous return comes back to the heart, the blood which is coming now and accumulating during diastole in the ventricle, it will tend to stretch the myocardium, wouldn't it? It will stretch the myocardium. The more the blood that comes in the ventricle, the more the stretch is. This is that stretch. Okay. It's a function of, again, no surprises here, end diastolic volume. The more the end diastolic volume, the more the stretch, right? Now, what does Frank Starling, the scientists, what did they discover? They discovered that the more stretch you do, of course, within limits, the more stretch you do of the myocardium, the more force they ex the, that myocardium exerts during contraction. So you stretch it out, and when you stretch it, it and allow it to contract, the higher the stretch, the more the force of its contraction. Okay, and hence the more the stroke volume. You get it? So this is stretching. This is more stretching. This is, by the way, the normal resting value. Above this is when you exercise, you are stretching it more. The venous return coming back is more, i.e. the EDV is more, the stretch is more. And when it's more, the corresponding force of contraction, i.e. The stroke volume is more right it's simple uh, he has highlighted the normal values normal value as you know as you remember stroke volume is 70 ml uh, per beat remember uh, and it corresponds to 135 of 
uh, the value of stretch the, uh, uh, EDV and diastolic volume 135. You must have read 120, 120, 130. It's it's a normal variation between between two between various books. This is not from Guyton. This is from uh, Silverthorne, uh, another very good book. Uh, okay, so this is the slope of the graph. This is how the myocardium basically uh, uh, functions uh, in the whole heart, in the intact heart. Okay. Uh, just for the student who go for threadbare details, the single myocardial fiber dynamics of stretch and force is different. Okay, you must have uh, 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 seen it under Frank, Frank starting law that it goes like this. Just follow this cursor here. It goes like this. So from bottom, it goes like this, like a crescent, right? But when you look at the, the intact heart, it goes like this. This is the difference. Don't be confused by it. We are right now, we are dealing with the intact heart. Uh, uh, the focus is in the, the, the intact heart and not the single fiber of the myocardium, right? So this is the starting law, basically. Um, this uh, diagram here uh, gives you um, the, uh, uh, an interesting detail, the effect of uh, catecholamines. So for the same amount of stretch, he has used that curve, which is the normal curve, and then he has plotted a curve in, in which the same amount of stretch was being done, but in the presence of norepinephrine, which is a catecholamine. So for each uh, degree of stretch in the presence of norep, uh, norepinephrine, the amount of stroke volume, i.e. the amount of force that the myocardium generated was more. In simple terms, look at this point A. In point A, look at the amount of uh, uh, the volume. EDV is constant. EDV is this. So this point A, but look at where it plots on the blue curve and look at where it plots on the red curve. It corresponds to a much higher force or stroke volume than it basically uh, uh, achieves under the normal control conditions. Basically, it's a fancy way of saying that norepinephrine or sympathetic stimulation increases stroke volume. Okay. Uh, we go back to our... Uh, uh, initial primary slideshow. Okay, so right, this is that section which I discussed with you just now. This is the Frank starting relationship. So the more EDV, the more force of contraction. I hope this is clear. Uh, and contractility. What is contractility? What is the difference between force of contraction and contractility? Contractility is what you saw. Uh, uh, the behavior of the myocardium in the presence of catecholamines. So for each degree of stretch in the absence of a catecholamine can get you so much of the force of contraction, can get you a normal stroke volume. But in the presence of catecholamines, the same amount of stretch will increase the stroke volume. This ability of the myocardium to, 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 to increase its it's a contractile profile in the presence of sympathetic stimulation is referred to as contractility. In physiology, we don't use, especially in heart physiology, we don't use this term uh, casually. Contractility has a specific meaning. Contractility is force of contraction, enhanced force of contraction in the presence of catecholamines. In the absence of catecholamines, it's simple EDV, uh, uh, fetching you the normal stroke volume. I hope you, uh, uh, you you understood that subtlety. Okay. Now, this bit we'll stop here for a bit. Let's explore what he says for EDV. EDV varies with venous return. I've, I've, I've discussed this uh, already with you. And uh, venous return is the determinant, is the, uh, the, end, uh, the EDV is the end point of re venous return. If you increase venous return, you increase EDV, you decrease venous return, you decrease EDV. So this is easy peasy, no, no, nothing new there. And it's a venous return as we'll discuss. Uh, we, uh, we, we did discuss it under uh, uh, central venous pressure, if I remember, if memory serves me right. Uh, but we'll also touch upon it in the ancillary factors in a bit. So venous return is basically aided by the, uh, yes, I did discuss this, yes, in one of the previous lectures. Please uh, refer to that. Uh, I, I hope I am able to remember to put a put a link on this slide for that particular lecture. So uh, it's it's basically uh, the peripheral pumps 
uh, in the in the lower limbs, then the abdominal pump and the thoracoabdominal thora thora pump. All of this aids venous return, which then becomes EDV, which then becomes uh, the main thrust behind the force of contraction, which determines stroke volume. Okay, so the nice back channel thing that we just did here, um, and let's now go on to the heart rate. Heart rate is the second parameter, a more simpler one. It's simply the number of times that the heart is contracting. Mind you, if you really remember your cardiac physiology, even increasing the heart rate will eventually increase the contractility. Now I want you to work it out. Increase heart rate will eventually increase the individual contraction uh, strength of each uh, contraction. Why is that? That's your homework. You can do it in your own time. So increasing heart rate is determined by, again, the rhythmicity. Uh, uh, it increases with sympathetic innervation. It decreases by parasympathetic uh, innervation. This is uh, pretty much straightforward. Uh, you want to revise it, you can revise that section of the heart physiology. Okay. Now, sympathetics are interesting in the sense that on one side, they enhance cardiac output by increasing heart rate. Remember, cardiac output is equal to stroke volume multiplied by heart rate. So sympathetics are nicely uh, sitting in the middle. They are enhancing heart rate. So they enhance cardiac output by enhancing heart rate and they enhance stroke volume. How? Just we discussed, we just discussed contractility. By enhancing a per stroke, every stroke, every contraction of the myocardium for its given EDV, more contractility, more forceful contraction uh, uh, happens. We call it contractility. So sympathetics increase that and add to stroke volume and hence have a dual effect on increasing uh, cardiac output through the heart rate and through the stroke volume. Okay. There's a third component. If you remember, we did mention the unstressed and the stressed volume. If you remember, I think in the baroreceptor reflex, we mentioned it, this term unstressed and stressed. Uh, we mentioned that veins under vein function as well. We mentioned that their main function is as a res to act as a reservoir of blood, remember? So not all the time, not all blood is being circulated. Some blood is stored in veins because of their reservoirs and have large diameters. Now, if you activate sympathetic nervous system, it basically vasoconstricts veins as well. Uh, pushing that unstressed volume, that stored blood uh, back into towards the heart that enhances venous return. And you know the rest of that uh, story. You know that well now. Okay. This will add to that end diastolic volume. This happens, this happens, and this happens. Okay. This is a very nice conceptual overview. This flow chart, it's brilliant uh, to understand the cardiac factors uh, affecting cardiac output. Okay. However, this indeed is incomplete. Okay. In that diagram, let me just go back. Okay. In this diagram, what we've just discussed is just this heart. Cardiac factors are factors affecting the heart only. Okay. Stroke volume is, we've discussed this heart rate. We've discussed this. Okay. So cardiac output is equal to stroke volume into heart rate. We've done that. However, there are other uh, considerations. What are those considerations? There, are, there is a whole because we, we we said that it's 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 one unit. There are circulatory factors. So, uh, what if the compliance of the aorta is not as much uh, as it's supposed to be? What if it's stiffer? What what do you think would happen? So let me go back. So what if these arteries are not flexible enough? They were flexible, but with with age they became stiffer. Yeah. When they became stiffer, now when you do the thing that you did with the heart, where it displaced volume from here to here, i.e. cardiac output, but now the cardiac output is being introduced in a much stiffer system. If you know what I mean, it's much stiffer now. So there will be changes. The heart will have to pump a bit extra hard. To introduce this to, to achieve the same 120 by 80 blood pressure in a stiffer system. Yes. So cardiac yeah, circulation compliance, circulatory uh, compliance basically matters. Resistance matters. 
if the TPR is more, and you will do this in your tutorial as an exercise, uh, your tutorial teacher will discuss uh, uh, a graph where they increased or decreased the TPR and looked at how the cardiac output fluctuated with it. Okay, so when you just you fluctuate the TPR, uh, you have uh, changes in the cardiac output. Mind you, during that exercise, the blood pressure basically uh, needs to be constant. More on that during that tutorial. Okay. Uh, similarly, uh, blood volume, again going back, what if the overall volume of this system was more than normal, okay, then obviously the cardiac output will have, will have, uh, uh, will be influenced by, by this, by this thing. Uh, remember that all of this, the cardiac factors, the circulatory factors, we'll be discussing some serious quantification of data. Uh, we'll go into detail. In the second lecture, this consider this as a nice, chunky overview of that second component of this lecture series. At the end, we are we are basically uh, uh, recapping the coupling factors. Um, th this is rather a conceptual overview of all the stuff that we have discussed uh, at the moment. So, uh, afterload basically represents everything which is going just uh, for remembering purposes please do not write this or reproduce this everything which is going against the cardiac output so all that resistance which goes against it which is anti-cardiac output okay uh, so uh, uh, aortic valve stenosis if if the aortic valve is stenosed it's not properly dilated it, it's not functioning properly that we will refer to it as in conceptual terms as increased afterload. If that valve is fine, but the guy has hypertension. So again, hypertension means that chamber in which your left ventricle is to push blood in, that pressure in that chamber is more. So the ventricle is under pressure now to increase, to generate more pressure. Again, its work has increased, cardiac work has increased because the afterload has increased. Okay, right. What about the preload? Preload is venous return. All the blood that is now coming back, uh, becoming the, 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 the load which the heart needs to carry through, that is the preload. Okay, so venous return is preload, um, which then become EDV. We've, we've discussed this. Uh, uh, and just a footnote, remember, don't forget the main circulatory filling pressure. That's the baseline of all this pressure business and so on and so forth please stay tuned for part two not part two the, the second lecture okay assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh